Thank you so much, Yash, for joining us to have this conversation, which is part of the International Conference on Interpreting and Shaping Transform Transformative Constitutions. Um, perhaps give us a little bit of background. We, of course, we've had such a journey as a country on constitution making, and we're at a critical phase um, at this time. Perhaps you can give us a background of this conference and why it was necessary. Um, well, our constitution is uh, what we call uh, transformative uh, constitution or a radical constitution, which seeks to break from the past and um, uh, move towards uh, uh, Kenya, which, whose vision is shared by many Kenyans, a result of this process that you mentioned. And uh, a transformative constitution is often full of values, principles, objectives, the vision of what kind of society and nation we are. And um, it also, of course, uh, has provisions on institutions and relationship between them. But, but it is often considered that uh, such a constitution is really a, a framework for the development of society, for the emergence of new values. And uh, this conference is concerned with the responsibility of the judiciary uh, for the implementation and protection of such a constitution. Uh, most constitutions deal with institutions, ours deals even more so with values. And these values have to be concretized. Uh, for example, if there is a, a value of integrity, well, what, the, what would this mean in practice? And uh, so the Constitution has some provisions on its uh, manifestation, but a lot of it has to be left to, to, uh, to development of society, behavior of government. And how do we concretize this so that civil servants, uh, ministers uh, abide by, that, uh, by integrity? So that if you then question a civil servant, conduct uh, on the ground of integrity, there may be no very clear provision in the Constitution other than just a general reference to integrity. And so the judiciary in the end will have to, to uh, define in the particular context of the case whether or not there has been a breach of integrity. And there are also many policy issues in, the, in such a Constitution, uh, many around uh, the notion of human rights. Uh, so, so these are often questions of balancing different interests through the medium of, the, of human rights. And these are very, in a way, political decisions, uh, policy decisions. And uh, under the Constitution, ultimately the courts will have to resolve their disputes. So this kind of Constitution gives a, a very big role to the judiciary. So we wanted to look at uh, what other countries have done uh, it, with a similar kind of constitutions. And so we've invited uh, a number of um, uh, uh, scholars from a number of countries uh, to see how they, in their countries, uh, gave effect to such radical constitutions. And the closest uh, uh, parallel to us is the South African experience. We looked at the South African constitution and borrowed some provisions. So we were very, very anxious to see how South Africans, who have about 13 years lead over us in terms of the new constitutions, how they have interpreted the constitution. Um, as, as you said, there's been quite a robust um, participation yeah. um, from different uh, disciplines and, um, and different institutions. We have had the Chief Justice and judges from, from our Supreme Court and Court of Appeal yes. as participants, and we've also had judges from the other East African countries, Tanzania and mm -hmm. Uganda. What do you think is the efficacy of their participation in such a... Well, I think extremely important. Uh, I think uh, we... we uh, learned uh, from their experiences, their approach to interpretation. They said to me, and they said publicly in the f forum, that they found this extremely useful for themselves. Uh, we had uh, uh, judges or scholars from Canada and Germany and uh, uh, Britain and uh, Hong Kong, and they also said they, they found this very useful, very s stimulating 
whereas we learned a lot from them. So it has been one of the best conferences I've been to in a long, long time, and it's fully worth it. I think you will begin to see the difference in the judgments of a courts in, in, in due course as a result of this, this, uh, these conversations. Um, I guess that is one of the major outcomes is that, that we're going to be looking for, is how a court's going to be interpreting issues of human rights, issues of good governance. Um, what do you think are the other conversations that we can have on the issue of constitutional implementation? Well, I, th I think one very important uh, issue which has not emerged so strongly uh, uh, has been the whole relationship of the judiciary to, the, to parliament and to the executive. Because the traditional idea of um, separation of powers or supremacy of parliament is gone now because uh, we have a, a, a supreme constitution which gives the judiciary a big, big responsibility. And parliamentarians and ministers can complain, look here, you're interfering with what is our responsibility. Because they can strike down laws as unconstitutional, give guidance on what kind of legislation would be would would follow from the constitution and and similarly you know the normally the executive expects to make policies whereas many judgments are really policy pronouncements so we have to see how the relationship between the three organs of the government have to be adjusted to the constitution and there has already been a, a conflict between the three institutions now. And, uh, and I, I think uh, we need to explore uh, what are the, the precise relationships. We want to avoid conflict between different institutions. We want each institution to understand its responsibilities and the limits of those responsibilities. So we don't get into constant clashes. It's understandable that in the very first or second year of the system, there, there would be these conflicts, but we must resolve these, and a very big responsibility will be on the judiciary. Um, our brothers and sisters in our neighboring countries, for instance, Tanzania, and we have other African countries that are currently um, undertaking constitutional reform processes. Yeah. And um, this dialogue, I think, has been very useful as yeah. well. Um, and coming from where we have come from in our journey with um, constitutional reform and where we're at right now with constitutional implementation, the definitely lessons that we have learned. Um, what are the key messages that you'd want to give countries that are undergoing constitutional reform processes, of course with the hindsight um, or the foresight that you have now of constitutional implementation? What would you have done differently um, and what are, the key, what are the key issues that you would say they must bear in mind as minimum standards as they're undertaking constitutional yes. reform? I mean, I would say uh, 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 sort of a twofold answer to your question. One would be the procedure of making a constitution. And uh, uh, traditionally, constitutions were made by the government, parliament, a handful of experts. Uh, but, uh, uh, but today, there's a lot of emphasis on participation. And uh, it was, cl it was Interesting that the uh, Tanzanian uh, uh, former prime minister who chaired the process in Tanzania said they learned a lot from our experience. I was invited to discuss with them in uh, Dar es Salaam as they were beginning. Our chief justice was invited. They looked at our constitution. So, so the process uh, that we had in Kenya was really very participatory. And I think it produced very good results. It created awareness among the people. It gave them a sense of their own, own, own power. It was very empowering for them. Uh, it reflected their aspirations. And, uh, and that was the strength of the Constitution. And so, so in that regard, I would say that uh, the participation is very important. Then the second aspect of the question is, what are the institution structure of the Constitution? And... Uh, uh, and there, again, they seem to have relied quite a lot on our constitution. And, and a number of other countries, uh, Zimbabwe's uh, constitution, which is being debated, follow, borrowed quite heavily from us. So a number of countries have done that. I think Ghana has done that a little bit. Uh, so, so it's a question of uh, how you structure it, 
and uh, and uh, and we think that uh, the the constitution that the institutions of government should be constantly responsive to the people, and the people shouldn't just be the recipi recipients of the law or government orders or policies, but they should be making them. And so we have built in a lot of structures for uh, people's participation, and that is what they want to do in Tanzania. But the fact is that uh, these democratic measures do not sit comfortably with the, with the politicians who feel their power uh, seeping away. away. Yeah, yeah, so, and they also want, many politicians are in business for, uh, for corruption, corrupt purposes, and they feel the more the process open and more people inv get involved, the less pro chances they will have to steal. So they resist this. This is exactly what has happened in Tanzania. The uh, commission delivered a very good draft, drawing quite heavily on our draw, on our constitution, and, and Tanzanians are very happy with it, the people, but the government didn't like it, so they, they are now trying to sabotage it. Uh, so there is a bit of a risk in, uh, in participation because the politicians don't often like the, what people want. And, uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That's all. Well, thank you.